Hey guys, we're right next to Roxy Club in Prague with Mike from Russian Circles. Thank you for finding time for this interview. I'm Mike, happy I was to. Uh, really wanted to, to talk to you, especially after that amazing last year's sold out show at Lucena Music Bar. So how is the European tour so far? It's been great. This is a co-headlining run with Cult of Luna. Good guys, good band, it was a no-brainer. This kind of came up if we'd be interested. And yeah, of course, you know. So a lot of rooms that we've not played before and it's a short two-week tour. Mm -hmm. So can't get into too much trouble. It's fun, so we're just kind of hitting our stride and we're wrapping this up in three days. So yeah. just when we're getting comfortable, kind of head back home. I really wanted to talk to you last year because uh, as I understood for years, you are starting your European, especially when they're headlining tours, you start in Prague and get your gear from Nomads of Prague. So sure. Yeah. Please tell us about the whole story. How did this actually start? Sure. Yeah, we love Nomads. They're the best. Our first European tour was actually over in the UK and we were supporting Tool and we'd never rented amps ever in our lives. We didn't you know, know what to expect. But some friends put us in touch with Nomads of Prague and Tomasz Melodic. He was a driver who drove all the way over to London, met us with the gear and he thought we were insane at first, you know, he's a great dude, but we got to know each other quickly and formed like a long friendship. So every time we're on a tour here in Europe, we usually try to start around Prague. And in some cases we'll practice here and I get the gear, make sure everything's dialed in, make sure we're comfortable with everything. Sometimes we'll meet up with the gear in a different city if it's like this tour started in Copenhagen. So Tomas, we call him, we call him everything, Ivan, Tomas, Tomas, right. we make it American, which is unfair to him. Uh, he'll meet us in different cities like Copenhagen this tour. So he goes out and picks the gear for us from Nomads that we requested. And yeah, they're awesome. I blew a speaker last night and we were able to go by the Nomad's office today and swap out some gear. Any friends that come through, we always, you know, encourage people to use Nomad's. Now it makes complete sense about the thing that I always found really cool are the names of the songs. We spoke about it some time ago. Sure within the overall uh, post-rock and understanding the names of the, of the tracks, but there are Mladek, Vorel, Vlastimil. So Mladek is dedicated to your tour manager. What about the other two? Uh, Vlastimil is a uncle of Mladek. So, um, and he sounds like a character, and we're like, man, this guy needs a song title. He just right. sounds like a, a piece of work. So we love Tomas, so it's a way of honoring Tomas again, almost like, okay, okay. this guy is something else, this, this last meal guy. So let's incorporate that just because it's a good association for us. A lot of our songs are named after people or places we have good connection with. And for the Vorel thing? Yeah, Vorel, that's a nickname of another Nomads driver that we became friends with. So. It's just an extension of the same, it's a nickname, and it just worked. We knew it means eagle, right. I believe, is that? Oh yeah, with the, you add the V, this is called, sort of like the Prague thing, or Bohemia thing, which me, as the Moravia guy, yeah. we don't like that. Okay. When they do that, we will say Orel, we will skip the V. Oh, okay, interesting. We don't like that, but <laughs> it's, yeah. I it's think cool. people call it Mr. Eagle, or um, I'm maybe making That's things cool. up. That's perfect. But, but I think, and as a, 
it derives from that. So right, right. Um, that's his like Czech nickname is is that. So. But a really funny thing is, uh, I remember I studied in Barcelona 2011, 12, mm -hmm. and I used the benefit of that amazing scene, and I wanted to meet Kailesa. We managed to happen, and through the label, they told me like, uh, this guy Ozak will take care of. Oh him. man, like, Ozak. Ozak, like, hell, really? Is it my countryman? Yeah, and suddenly in that really distant part of Barcelona. It's like really far from the center. Like, dude, are you Czech? Yo, oh, ciao, I'm Ozag. It's an amazing yeah. guy. Incredibly friendly guy. All the Czech words I could, I've learned could never be said on camera, pretty much. Yep. Just that kind of thing. And the, uh, the phrases are like, Tomas, what does that mean? <laughs> oh, wow, okay. <laughs> that, that's brutal. Okay, nice. All right, so, all right. I, I know what the expressions mean because we hear them thrown at other drivers and that kind of stuff and right. at the end of the night. Right, right. But uh, yeah, good sense of humor. For <laughs> Understand, skip it off the, off right, the camera. Right, exactly. Uh, we are very happy for having you guys this summer at Brutal Assault. Mm -hmm. uh, I spoke to Johannes and um, they will, it will be their third time. It will be your finally your first time at right. Brutal Assault. Uh, I must say that you guys playing a dunk uh, is one of the best live shows I ever heard. And I always had in my head, I want to hear those guys a brutal assault. Oh, nice. Um, so, have you checked some promo videos from that area of the beautiful fortress? I've heard Tomasz mention it a lot because he used to work with that festival a lot, yeah. and so I, I've heard about it just for years. We're excited to finally play. Yeah, we've heard about it for you know ten plus years, so it all worked out this year. We're yeah, we're yeah. excited to finally play. Um, coming back to that last year, the performance at Lucena Music Bar. Uh, why did you pick Helms Alley? It was finally for me a reason to, to check more because I knew some mm -hmm. of their older albums with sure. that amazing evil uh, fish. Oh, right, that sure. Is, a lantern fish. I have or... to like discover what's that. Mm -hmm. And I really love their latest album. So why did you That's decide right. to go with those guys? Next to the fact that you are on the same label. Yeah, we're we're on the same label, but also friends. We've you know through the Seattle scene. Brian, our bassist, is from Seattle, and he's you know buddies with a lot of them. And they ended up on Sergeant House, and that was cool just to you know help each other out. And they're a phenomenal band. And part of being a phenomenal band is being a great live band and seeing them live. Is a different experience than the records. The records are amazing and are their own entity that are, you know, there's pros and cons to records versus live, you know, mm -hmm. and, and they are a good example of that. We toured together in Europe a few years prior to that also. So we, whenever it's been four or five years, like, hey, let's go out and tour again. And how were you happy with the Czech support band, Manon Merit, their, this uh, shoegazy thing? Sure. And especially, how do you pick those, you know, like local, do you rely on the recommendation of a local promoter? Yeah, if we've not heard of them, like, it depends on the situation of the promoter. That was a case of, it was heavily, you know, recommended, and like, yeah, of course, this, this is great. And then it's fun to see how that plays out live, and they're a good example of, wow, this is even, like more epic. I pretty much checked the, the merch is available today. I saw just lately a couple of posts of the bands and especially you guys. Mm -hmm. Was it happening even before that the, that the venues were asking for a certain percentage? Yeah, a little bit, but no, never like this. This and is how about this tonight? Absurd. How about tonight? They didn't manage to check the local. Uh, usually, this tour has been no merch cuts, as we say. Like, okay. And if they do, if a venue takes a cut, maybe it's five, ten percent. Okay. And so usually, tonight is probably fine. 
probably fine. Most yeah. of these dates have been fine. And Tomas usually is good at talking with them or right. giving them a safety one. He's quite ten. big. You he's, know? <laughs> he's a massive human. So he's good at, you know, like, hey, let's, here's, here's all we made. Like, take that cut and kind of yeah. wheel and deal. But you're probably referring to the Paris show where we didn't sell any, we opted not to take, you know, merch into the venue with a French VAT tax and the commission from the company selling merch, we would lose 45% of everything oh, we made. Right. And at that point, it's like, we don't want to raise prices to pass it on to the people coming to the shows who want to buy merch. That's not right. You pay the designer to make the merch. You pay to have it made by the printing company. And then you have paid to be shipped somewhere. And then you haul it in box after box in the van or trailer, which eats up gas. Sure. And we all have expenses, you know, everybody on tour, but it's just like, it just feels wrong to like give some company a huge cut sure. for something they don't deserve. And before the pandemic, it wasn't really a thing. And in the US, it's very bad. It's worse than here, actually. We just did two US tours last fall. And all the clubs mentioned, oh, it's tough to tour, or it's, it's tough to make money now, you know, like after two years of not having as many shows. But we only have one way of income, and that's touring. There's not yeah. much CD sales, record sales, or some profit, because it's so expensive to print vinyl. So when, they, when the venues take some of our merch, it's like a, kind of a low blow. Like we can't raise it too much, because it's just a bad look, and not fair to the, you know, those coming to the show. The bar, like, they can, they have all kinds of options to make money. And we, the artists or bands, never take a cut of the bar, of course. We, that's not how the, the deal is, but going in on merch sales is an annoying trend that keeps happening. In the US, we were shocked how commonplace it's, it's been. And it's not going away. It seems to be, that's the new normal and it's, it's already kind of difficult to make it as a band on tour. And we're fortunate to do okay, but especially for the new bands who yeah. need all the help they can get. You can right. do other things for revenue at the club, but don't take away from the artists because they they're not gonna want to come to your club as frequently or yeah. at all. Yeah, yeah. So in that case, let's rather move to something more positive <laughs> mm -hmm. and the fact that I've always admired your style of writing, how the songs are having this uh, amazing uh, value of storytelling, but I wanted to more understand the chemistry between you guys. And it's almost uh, telepathic support, uh, especially I can feel that live, but I understood the latest album was written more individually than ever. Right. It was a product of the pandemic, you know, usually in the previous records, it'd be building up all these riffs, and then Dave and I would sort through them, and like this, this riff might go with that riff. If it doesn't, maybe it'll belong with this one over here, and they can buddy up, and oh, I have this another idea that can you know, be an intro or be another part of the song. So we'd you know, build up the riffs, and then get together in one room and just try it out organically. This time with the pandemic, since all three of us live in different cities that are quite far from each other, it made us hone our craft of home recording, demoing, and Dave getting comfortable with an electronic kit mm. and procuring that and learning to record. So instead of just sending riff ideas back and forth of and making this confusing mess where we can't just comfortably play for each other and bounce ideas back, we tried a new approach of writing full songs like Brian and I, and like submitting, here's the full song. Once everybody in the band signs off on each part, like this all sounds good and the arrangement is signed off on, then the other band members just lay their own recorded part on top of it. There is so much trust and overall 
decades of experience between you guys that you can basically know that oh he will be great in that he will know what to do Leave same, room, as, same yeah. as like can rely on the camera guy and the editor right sure. after i know exactly what to expect and they know what to expect from me sure and like i mentioned we leave room and like yeah. say hey or i need help there's one part of the song end of gnosis it was all kind of there felt good about the song but at the end of this song there's a chug kind of heavy part and i told brian i was like what when I asked my guys for help like hey can you help me let's make this a little more twisted Sometimes Kurt, the engineer and producer we, we work with, Kurt Ballou, sometimes he'll, once he hears a riff go through his filter, he'll have an idea that's cool. Like, oh yeah, let's add that little adjustment here or there. And that helps too. I hear from musicians more and more that the longer they are active, it's harder to write. So during pandemic, um, it was actually really weird in a way that they were, I heard from a lot of people, waves of uh, inspiration. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you just want to stick to your book or uh, like a bloody series of your some favorite TV show. Sure. And then from a frustration, maybe some, um, you know, inspiration came. Yeah. But how were you spending that time? Were you Finding, finding a new tools to, yeah, and I, w I would like to walk around these tiny cities somewhere for two weeks and just cut yourself out from, from the world and do something else. Um, yeah, stick to this massive book I, I skipped for years. Mm -hmm. What were some of the relaxing, inspirational things that you did during the pandemic? It, it is important to step away from a song. If you're lost in a song, it becomes myopic. You don't know, you can't really see what's happening there. Yeah. You can't hear it, so you need to get away. And as far as other places, one thing that's helpful is having multiple songs go on at different times. But as far as like literally stepping away from the pandemic, I love walking every sunrise, every sunset, just get out and just walk around. I walk and just listen to music, listen to podcasts even. And I just turned over my whole neighborhood, just walk every street, every possible avenue, I checked it out and fell in love with trees and houses that I'd never seen before. And During the pandemic, I was completely sober from everything, from coffee, from any substance, and just, I wanted to have a lower baseline of dopamine, so music really resonated with me, because right. it was a lonely time for a lot of people, so I just wanted to be able to appreciate nature, able to appreciate nature with this song, or a riff. I wanted to really focus on what was there. If anything, music was a way of stepping away from the news and the fear and aggravation. And it was a great time to hate your country and be upset with what's happening, how the rollout is, rollout of what's happening, and the unknown. And so, a lot of good habits came from the pandemic. Mm -hmm, I, don't, mm -hmm. I don't mean to you know, harp on the pandemic, sure, but sure. discipline was the one thing I took away from the pandemic was seeing what works for me and applying that. Now that things are back to normal, I can look back at how I kind of was on the game back then. And what were uh, shortly some of the albums that uh, from the classics that you relied on? I reverted back to my childhood state for some reason. Like I live alone and I wasn't seeing many people. And 
I went back to my childhood, which was a lot of Pantera. So I listened to Far Beyond Driven like a psychopath. I just listened to that every day almost, like wow. for a year. I was just like, Pantera, Pantera, <laughs> Pantera, Pantera. And there's a million other bands, some more experimental, some classical. I like playing classical guitar, so that's a totally different mindset than the heavy music. None of my friends listen to that, and that's not a thing I share with other people. Mm -hmm. So just through you know, online streaming, I was able to find different guitar players and different you know, composers and classical guitarists that meant a lot to me. Did you get some uh, book and properly studied some classic guitar artist? Uh, not during the pandemic. On tour, I do that. I like reading rock bio biographies okay. on tour. So, like, that, especially guitar players and the bands. But uh, there's not a single like deep dive I did during. The, you know, it's usually a book at a time. You know, I don't really do multiple books on any artist. Cool. And it's okay. interesting to see if it's a proper biography about the career of a band seeing what made the music take off, why there were dips, and why it kind of came back, and what was happening behind the scenes. It's mm -hmm. interesting mm -hmm. to learn, to yeah. see, you know, learn from their mistakes. What are you reading right now? For the uh, I'm reading like Galapagos by Kurt Vonnegut, which is, I usually read heavier, not heavier stuff, but I don't like fiction that much. Mm -hmm. But on this tour, I did want something. I just wanted something lighter, and uh, I forgot how great Kurt Vonnegut is and how funny he is. So that's been nice, just to have something less esoteric and something yeah. just more fun to read. Thank you for finding time for this interview. Of I'm finally glad that we we did it, and looking forward to tonight's shows. Thank you. Thank Thanks you for man. having me. Cheers.